what actions can I take to protect myself from chemicals in the outdoor air? Yeah, so outdoor air, as I mentioned, I think in a previous um, clip, we have both indoor and outdoor air discussion in here because they are two different things. And, you know, um, indoor air, you have much more control over in most of the time um, at work. Um, you know, if you're working in a building that's owned by someone else, you might have cleaning crew. I don't have a cleaning crew that uses anything but the stuff I supply. Um, I don't let them spray pesticides. I'm at my office now outside my door. I don't want it anywhere near the space that I rent. Um, whether that really ultimately makes a difference in any way, who knows, but it's a very simple ask, uh, you know, not a big deal. But essentially you can only control so much in indoor, um, but work at it. And then you, you really, outdoor air is mostly about, you know, are you a commuter? Can you put in an air filter in your car, which are not costly that go right into your, um, you know, AC adapter for a trip to and from, you know, the city. My husband used to go to um, long distances into cities and I would, I would take an alcohol swab across his forehead and it would be like nasty, dirty because, you know, you collect this stuff as you move through the world. And, um, you know, it was really eye opening. And I think I saw that more when he commuted to places that were more polluted than local places where we live, where there's a lot more greenery and, and the air seems to be better. But, you know, again, this is not a, an evidence based study, but um, I just want people to think about um, and we list a lot of really practical ways to try to control what what you can control, but also think about ways to manage outdoor air. We also have. Um, you know, certain apps that are well vetted for ozone layer, um, ozone rating, and whether or not you have to really think about the timing of going outside. If your kid has asthma, if you have COPD or, or, or emphysema or reactive airway, or if you have multiple chemical sensitivity to chemicals in general, you know, we want people to be armed when they walk out the door to know based on certain apps that are vetted, you know, what the air quality is, what's the rating, should they be out during these hours, should they be limiting hours, you know, that kind of thing. What can you tell us about chemicals and COVID-19? So this is a really interesting topic. And at the beginning of COVID, say March and, and, and February, March of 2020, you know, I started talking with my co-author, Fred Bomsal, who is so brilliant. And we started to discuss this topic um, because what we know, and this is before COVID, is that environmental chemicals affect your immune system and raise inflammatory markers. Okay, the immune system is remarkably complex. There's two systems, there's old and new, there's, um, they talk to each other, the humoral, um, you know, and innate and humoral um, immune systems. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's just really remarkable. I'm trying to get to the page that I wanted to show people. Um, one second here, yeah. So I'm sorry, the, immune, the adaptive and the, immune, and the um, humoral, which are basically old and new kind of um, systems. And, you know, we kind of go into it here a little bit because I wanted people to have the most very basic understanding of how complex in a, in a way the immune system is. We know the chemicals, many of them, including BPA, which is probably the most well-studied of the endocrine disruptors, has enormous effects on the immune system. In fact, we put that um, important study in as well. There's many, but they're the one that's really telling. And so we know that when people are exposed to so many chemicals that they're in our bloodstream, they're in our breast milk, they're in our urine, these are tested, you know, cord blood of newborns is, has upwards of 200 chemicals, believe it or not, in cord blood at birth. So we're kind of born polluted, which is a sad story, but true, even with mom's best efforts, honestly. Um, so we know that these chemicals actually on their own raise inflammatory markers. If you pair that, and you start with a baseline level of inflammation, technically from processed foods and chemicals and stress and makeup and blah, blah, blah. And then you, you add this insult such as COVID, which certainly um, you know, favors in terms of poor outcomes, those with comorbid conditions that are caused by chemicals like diabetes, insulin resistance, heart disease, autoimmune disease, um, those comorbid conditions we hear about. That is connected to this inflammatory um, exposure, um, endocrine disruptors. So you have these exposures over time, your primed immune system, these comorbid conditions, and of course, now we know worse outcomes when exposed to COVID-19. COVID-19 will not be the last of our exposures that are infectious. It's unfortunate, and we've kind of been hearing this. We're at a new time now where we're gonna get more infectious exposures. 
we're also getting more exposure to Lyme disease, which is not even seasonal anymore. As climate change is changing us, we're, we're seeing more of these things affecting human population. But the long answer to your short question is environmental chemicals increase inflammation. Inflammation does lead to the persistence risk of comorbid conditions. We know, know that. Um, and that those comorbid, comorbid conditions, in fact, do raise the risk for worse outcomes when exposed to COVID. So again, it argues for cleaning up your diet, cleaning up your water, cleaning up your cosmetics, figuring out your home environment, surveying your area that you live and breathe in, your kids and your dog and your cat live in, and really doing the best you can to get yourself in fighting shape, get your nutrition up, get better sleep, manage stress, because these are anthropologically appropriate behaviors and lifestyle changes. Can you tell us more about BPA, where it's found, what impact it, it has on my health? Yeah, BPA is uh, my co-author's bailiwick. This is his world, world, uh, worldwide um, research. But I will tell you, having worked with him, but also having read the, the plethora, I mean, the magnitude of, of international data on bisphenol A. Um, bisphenol A is just one compound of the bisphenols. Um, BPA got a lot of attention, as we mentioned earlier, um, when it was removed from baby bottles because the data was so robust um, in the US. And by the way, we've only removed five chemicals in the US since 1976, literally. Uh, Europe has removed upwards of 1,300 at this point. So we're seeing now that even it's a bad chemical and there's plenty of data. I mean, lead, we now know, went from being toxic at this level to toxic at this level to toxic at this level. And now we know it's toxic at any level, right? Um, but bisphenol A, BPA is so well studied that we now have enormous amounts of information on its risk for infertility, um, uh, for its risk for um, developmental issues in newborns, for changing the genitalia in males because it can block androgens during um, in utero development of male and females. Um, it can have dimorphic brain changes in terms of the brain being female or male. People don't realize that that's actually a separate developmental process. We know that BPA affects insulin resistance. It increases, it raises blood pressure. We know that it can affect thyroid conditions, thyroid function. Uh, we know that BPA can affect um, hormone sensitive cancers, breast, prostate, uterine, endometrial, thyroid cancers. Um, we know that it can cause um, preterm delivery. It affects birthing. We know that it can affect bone development and osteoporosis because that's another hormone sensitive issue. It affects insulin, which is a hormone. Um, it affects autoimmune disease risk. So you can imagine it's a pretty toxic stuff, but in fact, we've only removed it from baby bottles, thank God, but it should be added to a lot of other products. It's the most um, produced um, industrial chemical, I believe, worldwide. That being said, um, the way we can remove it is by looking at where we get it from most. Mostly it's ingestion. So there were great Harvard studies that they've done, I mean, a lot of studies, but one Harvard study actually switched out canned soup or added canned soup versus homemade soup to participants, 75 participants, and then they did a washout. And they found that just the canned soup, and it was Progresso that they actually openly used in the, in the study, just changing out a canned soup intake at lunch to a homemade, no packaging, freshly made soup, reduced um, BPA exposures in those 75 participants by 1100%. BPA has a six hour half-life, Half, 50% is lost every six to eight hours. So over the course of a couple of days, you can wash that exposure out. The problem is we're getting exposed by BPA all the time. So it never really lowers. But one of the key ways to lower BPA, which is very, very measurable, and I've done this for my own body and for some patients, is that you just stop canned foods as if you're able to, um, and you substitute in frozens or fresh. Um, so just the food packaging is really key. Um, and so that's the number one way to reduce BPA, in my opinion. But it's also in products like nail polish, shampoos, conditioners, hairspray actually has BPA, um, which makes it um, uh, stiff um, and, and soft and stiff at the same time. So there's, there's a lot of different ways you can get rid of BPA, but the number one way is ingestion. And that can be doable by anybody because it's half-life and its property um, happens to be um, reasonable to work with. 